Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to look at some more uh, materials with the cell membrane and how things move in and out of the cell. So welcome to Advanced Cell Membrane Movement, video 4-4 here in biology. And again, we're going to look at how um, the advanced cell movement. So we're going to look at things like co-transporters and sodium potassium pumps and more specifics that relate to how things are able to move in and out of the cell because it's such an important part of biology and cell biology that things are able to appropriately move in and out of the cell in order for the cell to survive. So today we're going to be able to explain how molecules move across the cell membrane and to be able to understand some more complex components of the cell membrane and how that all ties into the movement of materials in and out of the cell. So if you remember from last time, we talked a lot about basic cell membrane structure, and this includes the phospholipid bilayer. If you remember, the phospholipid bilayer is selectively permeable, which basically means it just that uh, certain materials are allowed in and out of the cell. It just depends on what the cell needs at that particular time. It's a fluid mosaic model, meaning that all of the integral proteins and carbohydrates and cholesterols are able to move freely within the membrane, very similar to how buoys move within an ocean. They're able to just kind of move around and float in there, very similar to how the proteins can move in the cell membrane. The phospholipid bilayer is composed of a hydrophilic head, which is attracted to water, and a hydrophobic tail, which is made of lipids, and that lipid tail is nonpolar, so it wants to avoid water at all costs. So we also have cholesterol, and cholesterol is an integral part of the membrane. It helps maintain the structure of the membrane, helps kind of keep the membrane together. We have membrane proteins, which exist in the membrane that provide structure and transport in and out of the cell. And carbohydrates, which are primarily used for communication. And these include things like glycoproteins, which are carbohydrate chains that are attached, attached to proteins, and glycolipids, which are carbohydrates that are attached to lipids. So we have a wide variety of things that are in the, the cell membrane, which is what gives the term fluid mosaic model. Um, fluid meaning that things can move freely about, and mosaic meaning that there are multiple components of the cell membrane. So lots of different things going on in here, but this is basic stuff, and hopefully you already have a good grasp of what's going on here. We also talked a lot about how things can move in and out of the cell. And we talked about diffusion, and diffusion is just the movement through the membrane from high to low concentration. These molecules are typically nonpolar molecules because they can diffuse right through the membrane. Polar molecules would not be able to do so because of the hydrophobic tails that exist that are nonpolar, so polar materials would not be able to cross through. And this requires no energy. Facilitated diffusion or passive transport usually requires a protein channel and goes from high to low concentration as well and does not require energy. An active transport requires a protein as well, but goes from low to high concentration and requires ATP. It takes energy to go from low to high. I always use the example of spraying a perfume bottle. If we spray a perfume bottle, it will naturally diffuse throughout the classroom or diffuse throughout wherever you are. Um, you could smell the molecules at first, but over time they diffuse so far apart that you can't smell them anymore. Those particles are going from a high concentration inside the bottle to a low concentration outside and throughout the air. Active transport is the opposite of that. It would be like taking those molecules that are in the air and taking each individual molecule and placing it back in the bottle. Now that's going to require a lot of energy. So that's more active transport when we go from low to high concentration. Um, it's very difficult to do so and requires ATP or energy to do so. So those are the three types of basic cell membrane movement. Um, some more things to understand about membrane proteins that they are just more than transport and uh, structure. Um, yes, they can perform transport functions, but they also function as enzymes. We've talked a lot about how proteins function as enzymes, and that's the case within the cell membrane. Uh, signal transduction, they can take in signals from outside of the cell and send that signal into the cell to the nucleus or to other organelles that need to um, respond to that particular signal. They also provide an anchor to the cytoplasm. You can see the microfilaments and microtubules. They anchor themselves to the cytoplasm and cytoskeleton, which um, help provide structure for the cell and the cell membrane. Additionally, membrane proteins are for cell-to-cell -cell recognition, so cells are able to recognize other cells. 
This is important when we talk about immunological reasons, the immune system being able to recognize certain cells and be able to determine what goes in and what goes out of the cell. And then joining, some cells adhere to each other. Uh, not all cells are just floating in space. Um, some cells are joined to each other and membrane proteins can do that as well. So a lot of different purposes for membrane proteins inside of the plasma membrane. Remember that carbohydrates, recognition is important to cell interaction in the immune system. Carbohydrates perform that interaction. So we talk about things like glycoproteins and glycolipids. Those carbohydrates are important for cells to interact with each other and important for the immune system to recognize what cells are there because the immune system looks for foreign cells and so if the incorrect carbohydrates are present, the immune system will know that it's a cell that is not supposed to be inside of the body. So carbohydrates are very important for interaction and immune system. One thing that's important is endo and exocytosis. And the vesicles from the Golgi are made of the same material as the plasma membrane. So when the vesicle leaves the cell, it fuses with the membrane, which is what you see in the bottom picture here, and pushes the material out, and that is known as exocytosis. And when material fuses with the membrane and allows material in, you see it in the top, it's pinching inward, and that vesicle will go, go to the Golgi. That is endocytosis. So the top picture, we have endocytosis, where the materials are going into the cell, and that vesicle will then go to the Golgi apparatus and ship to other parts of the cell. The bottom part is leaving the Golgi, exocytosis, and fusing with the cell membrane, pushing the material out of the cell. So we see here there are a couple different processes that occur within the Golgi and with the cell membrane, both endo and exocytosis. Remember that exo means to leave, endo means to come in. Remember that the bilayer is selectively permeable. So things like sugar, amino acids, oxygen, sodium ions, potassium ions, chlorine, calcium ions, chlorine ions, all of those biologically significant ions are able to pass through the cell membrane and they're able to move through different rates using different mechanisms. So some of these are going to require just simple diffusion while others can require active transport or uh, passive transport through a protein channel. So lots of different ways that things can get in and out of the cell, and we'll look at that here in a little bit. So again, if you remember, simple diffusion requires no energy, and simple movement to cross the membrane from high to low concentration. And these are simple molecules like oxygen and nitrogen, nonpolar molecules that can simply diffuse through the cell membrane. They do not require a protein channel and no energy. So it's just simple movement to cross the membrane. Very easy movement, so just simple diffusion from a high to low concentration directly across the cell membrane. We have passive transport, which requires a protein, also known as facilitated diffusion. This is from high to low concentration and does not require energy. These are things like water or other hydrophilic molecules. So uh, polar molecules is what we're looking at here that are able to go through facilitated diffusion. This also occurs with larger molecules that cannot simply diffuse directly across the cell membrane. Larger molecules and polar molecules require a protein in order to go from high to low concentration directly across that cell or plasma membrane. And lastly, there is active transport, which requires ATP. This uses a protein and is required to go from low to high concentration. So again, this is the opposite of all of the rest, and that's why it requires energy to do so. One good example is the sodium-potassium pump. And we will look at that here a little bit later on. Speaking of the sodium-potassium pump, we want to talk about how this requires ATP. Um, the process of moving sodium and potassium ions across the cell membrane is uh, an active transport process that involves breaking apart ATP to provide the energy required to move the sodium out of the cell and the potassium into the cell. So it involves uh, an enzyme, and we typically call this sodium-potassium pump. This allows the cell to be able to keep a large amount of sodium on the outside and a large amount of potassium on the inside. So this takes the transport of three sodium ions to the outside, which you can see here, we're going uh, in one and two. The sodium is going from the inside to the outside, which requires ATP to do so. 
and the potassium goes from the outside to the inside. This is really important uh, specifically for things like nerve or muscle cells because this creates what's called action potential, which allows a, a signal to be conducted across those cells. Sodium potassium pumps are an excellent example of active transport because it requires ATP to get the sodium to go out of the cell and the potassium to go into the cell. The last type of transport we want to talk about is cotransport. And cotransport is a protein that involves uh, two molecules at one time. And so we look here, sucrose, moving sucrose across the cell membrane is an example of cotransport because it requires hydrogen ions or protons to be moved across the membrane at the same time to allow sucrose through. Well, hydrogen ions need to be pumped out of the cell in order for them to be pumped back in using the cotransport. So the proton pump up at the top requires ATP, so that is an example of active transport, to move the hydrogen ions outside of the cell. Those hydrogen ions then move back into the cell along with sucrose. So in order for sucrose to get in, it requires a couple of steps. The proton pump has to pump the hydrogen ions out of the cell, and then those hydrogen ions move back into the cell, but that allows sucrose to move across as well. So that's just an example of co-transport, where we have two molecules, two ions at a time, that is moving across the cell membrane. So hopefully you understand a little bit more about how certain molecules move across the cell membrane. Again, there's so much more to this that I wish we could dive into, but that's really more for an AP biology or a college level biology class. And hopefully you understand more about the complex components of the cell membrane. We'll come back and look at uh, a little bit more about this, and we will see you guys next time. Have a great day, guys. Bye.